<laughs> Tony, thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. Uh, in many ways, I owe so much uh, to Tony Sanchez. Uh, he's an individual uh, who also was born and raised in Laredo. Uh, when I came to San Antonio as a young faculty member, you know, encouraged me to put my hat in the ring in regards to the presidency of the Health Science Center. Then served on the Board of Regents who ultimately selected me as the president of the Health Science Center. And he had the vision of expanding the Health Science Center's presence in Laredo, in Edinburgh, and in Harlingen, uh, where we were able and continue uh, to enhance the platform uh, for really medical education. Uh, in the Lower Rio Grande Valley and dental education in Texas, you know, where so many, many students would never have had the opportunity uh, to pursue what I believe is one of the most beautiful professions, which is medicine. And so, Tony, I owe so much to you, and I will continue to do everything within the power that God gives me to continue to excel uh, and really position the University of Texas system uh, to even a higher platform of excellence. So let's give Tony a big applause. And also, uh, I do want to give an applause to all the students uh, who are here representing their high schools or are here doing internships during college because you are our future. And again, everything we do you know, as educators is really focused on making sure that the next generation of American citizens and citizens from around the world have a better quality of life. I mean, it really is what we want for each one of our children. To Mickey, uh, thank you very much uh, to you and your board, uh, to the sponsors for asking me to be your keynote speaker today. Let me begin by expressing to you that uh, my first few month, months as chancellor of the University of Texas system, you know, have really been a great joy. Uh, to have the opportunity uh, to really visit the nine academic universities and the six health institutions under the University of Texas system, ranging from all geographic regions of, of Texas, you know, really results in what I believe unlimited possibilities for this nation and for the world. As Mr. Sanchez has stated, we are responsible for the education of over 193,000 students. And remember, education is also very individual. A parent leaving their most precious asset to a university, you know, for us to be able to provide with them tools to become lifelong learners and really be the leaders, you know, of this nation uh, into tomorrow. Well, as Tony stated, I, I had no idea uh, that when I came back from Johns Hopkins finishing my fellowship that I would expect to be in this current role as chancellor of what I believe one of the great institutions of higher education in the world. I left Laredo, Texas, and I embarked upon a higher education degree at Yale. And I will tell you that the most difficult transition in my life was that transition from Laredo to Yale. <laughs> that, that first year, every time I received a grade, I thought that tomorrow would be my last day at Yale. <laughs> but. You know, my parents, uh, individuals who loved me, my grandparents, said, don't give up. Continue your focus. And if you, if you love medicine, you know, you still have an opportunity to do that. Well, anyhow, Yale gave me a tremendous work ethic uh, because I really had to catch up. I never let up in my work ethics of trying to do better. And by the time I got to medical school, uh, it ended up being kind of a relatively easy road. Although after the third time of taking biochemistry, I decided maybe economics was for me. <laughs> I uh, remember in the library at Southwestern, I closed my book and I said, I quit. I'm going back to Laredo and I'm going to talk to Dad. So I arrived in Laredo. It must have been about 10.30 at night. Dad had about 100 patients in his clinic. And... Uh, it was probably about 11 o'clock at night before he got out of the clinic. And so I stepped down from the hill, which is where the hospital was, and Dad was there. And it was dark, and he said, you know, Carlos, what are you doing here? I go, no, Dad, it's Francisco. 
because there was 10 of us and it was kind of dark. He said, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, Francisco, I thought you were in medical school. Well, then I need to talk to you about this. Uh, so we had about a 45-minute conversation, and Dad is somebody who always wants the best for his children. He goes, Wilson, I completely understand, and, you know, let's go talk to Mother. <laughs> so it was midnight by the time I got to the house in Laredo, and uh, Mother was asleep, and so we go to the master bedroom where, where Mom was, and Dad goes, look who's here. And so uh, mother asked the question, well, what are you doing here? I thought you were taking a biochemistry exam in about four days because we'd always ask her to say a prayer, you know, before every exam. <laughs> that started at Yale because I thought I'd flunk every test. Um, well, I told her what my new plans were, and she goes, nothing of it. And she scolded both dad and myself for dad for agreeing. And that following morning, we took the 6 a.m. Texas International flight out of Laredo back to Dallas. She made dad stay in class with me for three or four days, and we both agreed that the wrath of mother was not worth it. We did not want to experience that again, that medical school would be a lot easier. Well, anyhow, Southwestern uh, Medical School uh, ended up actually being a glorious time. And there I was exposed to what I believe some of the greatest faculty uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with. And it was Michael Brown who uh, eventually got a Nobel laureate. Uh, but it's the power of how a faculty member can influence a young student. He asked me, well, what are your plans? I go, well, my plans are to go back to Laredo and really join my father's practice. He goes, well, have you ever thought about pursuing a career in academic medicine? He was already, he was already thinking about you know, how important it is to identify a young, bright, talented student to become the future pipeline of faculty members in academic health centers. And so really, Michael Brown was the one who encouraged me to pursue a career in academic surgery. Uh, he wrote my letter of recommendation to Mass General. Um, when I got accepted to Mass General, I ran back to, Tony, I mean, to Michael Brown and told him how ecstatic I was. And his remarks were, don't disappoint me. <laughs> and so I often uh, will go back to him and ask him, you know, have I disappointed you yet, Michael? He goes, no, but there's still time. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, from there, uh, I was exposed to just incredible uh, physicians, physician scientists. And that's where I fell in love with the field of pediatric surgery. Uh, from, John, from, from Mass General Hospital, I went to Johns Hopkins and did a fellowship in both pediatric surgery and transplantation surgery uh, because I took care of so many children uh, with some terrible, you know, hepatic insufficiency problems. Uh, but anyhow, at the end of my fellowship at Johns Hopkins, um, I was offered a wonderful opportunity uh, to join the faculty at Hopkins. And, uh, and that was to be the director of their pediatric transplant program. Well, um, I was about to sign on the dotted line. Uh, I came running home to the house to Graciela and my two children, Maria, Cristina, and Barbara. And I told Graciela about this great opportunity. She goes, well, that sounds wonderful. I think I'll come and visit you and the children every other weekend. <laughs> she had other goals in mind about going back to Texas. Uh, she asked me a question. Who have been the most important people in your life? And I go, well, my parents, my grandparents, my cousins, my brothers and sisters, uh, and also being in that enriched region of South Texas. And she asked a question, well, don't you want your children to be exposed to that environment? Don't you have a responsibility to give back to a region that has given so much to you? Don't you want your children to be exposed to the beautiful Mexican-American culture that we were a part of? And I asked Dad, you know, I was a little confused, and Dad made it crystal clear. Dad stated he's still a practicing physician 52 years as a practicing physician in Laredo, Texas. He said, well, are you concerned about, you know, that you need to be at a very large academic health center? Because if you are, I think you're missing the point. The point is, is that the relationship between a physician and a patient is just as powerful and just as important in Cortula, Texas, as it is in Baltimore or in Boston. So, you know, if that's what you're thinking about, I would ask you to reassess. And we came back to San Antonio and I joined the faculty 
of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. No other university, I believe, would have given a young assistant professor the opportunity that the University of Texas gave me. They had the confidence in allowing me to establish a pediatric transplant program in San Antonio. Within five years, we built one of the largest pediatric transplant programs in the United States. And it was that university uh, that also allowed me one day to take care of the nanny who actually changed our diapers in Laredo. Because one weekend that I was on call, this person came in with fulminant hepatic failure and I ended up doing her transplant one week later. What are the chances of that happening? It goes back to coming back to the region that gave you so much. And so it was the University of Texas who gave me the platform through Tony's leadership uh, to have the opportunity to become the president of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. I do have to express to you that when I did tell uh, this colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins Hospital that I declined his offer uh, to become the director of pediatric transplantation, he commented, you know, Francisco, I'm really concerned that you're committing academic suicide. Because they had a, they had a little problem imagining, you know, what the, what the opportunities were in South Texas. Well, five years, I called him uh, later after I started, and I asked him, you know, could you write a letter of recommendation for me? And he goes, well, of course, Francisco. You must be being promoted to associate professor. And I go, well, that happened last week. But I'm asking whether you'd write a letter of recommendation for me to become president of the Health Science Center. And there was a pause. He goes, my goodness, things are going well for you. <laughs> Well, in uh, December of 2009, uh, when the Board of Regents asked me to consider being interviewed for the Chancellor of the University of Texas system, they did ask for a couple of letters of recommendation. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I called this distinguished surgeon from Johns Hopkins and asked him, could you write me a letter of recommendation? And he goes, what are you up to? And I go, well, I've been asked to interview for the Chancellorship of the University of Texas system, one of the great institutions of higher ed in the world. And he goes, my goodness, can I get a job, you know, can I get a job with you? I go, I don't know, you might be committing academic suicide. <laughs> Well, I'm also told that you want to hear a little bit about my personal story. And I want to begin, you know, before that, addressing some concerns that I have seen as I've made my way throughout Texas and throughout this nation. Uh, concerns that must be a part of our continuing dialogue about education, Congressman Hinojosa, and the future of this great nation. The Hispanic population of Texas, as we all know, will soon be a majority. It is absolutely appropriate that we focus our attention not only on highlighting the successes of Latinos across the nation, but more importantly on nurturing the talents and aspirations of the young Latinos who will soon take their rightful place as leaders at every level of governance and public service. This is exactly what this organization does. These young people we're talking about stand on the strong, stand on the strong foundation of courageous men such as our ambassador and women who have worked over generations to advance the cause of equal participation and responsibility. And we now stand at the threshold of the realization of their dreams. We share the obligation to usher in this new era in a way that makes all Americans grateful for its arrival. But it also means that we must be taking advantage of the opportunities and overcoming the challenges that affect disparities in public education. A complete education, an education built at the intersection of knowledge and action, an education that harnesses the great lessons of science, of literature, of history and the art, is the greatest gift that we can give our children. And it is the bedrock on which leadership is built. The poet Robert Frost wrote verse through such a rich intersection of disciplines. And you can glean this from a lecture that Frost delivered 
1937 when he delved into what discipline, if any, was closest to poetry. The great poet found at first glance that it was science. Frost said that science might be nearer to poetry than most because it is nothing if it is not achievement and if it is not creative. Frost also found akin to poetry and philosophy because this discipline fosters flashes of light. And he found it in athletics because poetry stirs words into motion. And in the English department who, keeps, who are keepers of the text. And so if these various disciplines had not intersected in his own education, one questions whether his beautiful verses might have ever been written. Can you imagine a world without his lines from the road not taken? And listen to Frost's words. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, what an immeasurable loss it would have been for us if we did not have this verse to turn to today when pondering our life's choices. And those roads, these divergent roads, were very important for me as I was asked to consider the daily life of a wonderful profession, pediatric surgery, or the daily life of a key administrative leader in higher education. Well, it is an unsettling thought that Robert Frost might not have committed them to paper if he had not been blessed with the strong multidisciplinary education that he received. One's education is fundamentally that important. And, unfortunately, as we all know, there is significant risk for the present and future generations if we don't boldly address the challenges that face us. The disciplines of art, science, philosophy, literature, mathematics require for integration of brilliance, not only in literature, but in all the fields, such as medicine or law or architecture, are really sometimes no longer the consistent fabric of many American students' backgrounds. And our, our educational system is not where it needs to be and, in fact, continues to remain strained. So this crisis in education, which I'm so pleased that the Latino Leadership Network is boldly looking at, and particularly in the education of underrepresented minority students, has been called a gathering storm. So tomorrow's revered leaders that might have been are in jeopardy while we tinker around the margins of the concerted effort that we need to save them. So let me give you the evidence, starting with the number of baccalaureate degrees that are being lost based on a study mortgaging our future. During the 1990s, between nearly 1 million and 1.6 million baccalaureate degrees were lost among college qualified high school graduates from low and moderate income families. And during this current decade, between 1.4 and 2.4 million more baccalaureate degrees are being lost. And these estimates are very conservative. These numbers exclude students who either did not graduate from high school or graduated but are not college ready. So imagine as best you can the students' faces behind these staggering numbers since statistics mean absolutely nothing if you don't individualize it and personalize what they mean. So think of the opportunities that have been missed and the numbers of young people gone astray and visualize the lives that they could have changed, the ideas and the innovations that they could have created in order to make this world a better place. So it is absolutely essential that we, as Hispanic leaders and individuals in this room, do everything within our power to address these issues. So with these grim statistics affecting not only minorities but Americans, the Robert Frost might not have made it to the present. The odds would have been overwhelmingly that I would have been your speaker today as a Hispanic educated through public schools from a small boarded town in Laredo in the 1960s and the 1970s. So given this scenario, in fact, it's probably not an exaggeration to state that only a small percentage of you might be occupying your seats right now if you had, not got, if you had gone through the strained public educational system that faces many of our cities in America. That we are losing a competitive student pipeline is only one element of the storm. Not only is the strain that I mentioned a parent in public schools at the undergraduate level, but it's also showing itself in our graduate schools. And I'm so pleased that you brought up the issue about how important it is to expose students to a research environment because the evidence is clear. Many of those students will pursue graduate education and in fact, pursue professional careers and be the future faculty 
of our American universities. So some are forgetting the prophetic words of Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve. He said, if we are to remain preeminent in transforming the knowledge into economic value, the US system of higher education must remain the world leader in generating scientific and technological breakthroughs and in preparing workers to meet the evolving demand of skilled labor. In this instance, Greenspan was wise. He concluded toward the end of his career as chairman, if you can solve the educational problem, you don't have to do anything else. If you don't solve it, nothing else is going to matter all that much. The voices expressing concern over the weakening of our global competitiveness and the decline of our educational systems are many, but unfortunately the response has been slow and the data are compelling. American 12th graders scored near the bottom on the recent third international math and science study. U.S. students placed 19th out of 21 developed nations in math and 16 out of 21 in science. So it's apparent that there is a lot of work to be done, and I'm proud to say that the University of Texas system is addressing these challenges in a very deliberate way. By sharing the blueprint of my career, I hope to give you some unique insight into what we are finding is working to ensure that we prevent the devastation to the educational opportunities for our younger generation. First of all, I went through the public school systems of Laredo, Texas, where I was growing up in a small border city. I was one of 10 children, or am one of 10 children, five sisters and four brothers. And I'm proud to say that during my growing up, the fundamental joy in our family was, you know, really again, the love and respect for each other the importance of education, and then to give back to our communities. So my grandmother, Abuelita, we'd get together every Sunday for comidas, 36 grandchildren. And Abuelita would each give us a dollar, and then she'd take it back. And she'd go, this, you know, we were thinking about super bubbles and candy, but she'd take it back and she would tell us, mijito, this is for your college education. This is a savings that I'm saving for you. She kept her word. When we graduated from high school, she'd give us a check, and it was to pay for our part of our tuition in college. All 36 of her grandchildren received a college education. All 10 of my brothers and sisters not only received a college education, but received a professional degree. And to this day, that's what gives my parents the most joy. Now, mother, as you can imagine, was a disciplinarian. I still have a couple of scars on my back. I may add some recent. <laughs> but uh, she did demand of her children one thing, because she felt it was under our complete control. And that was an A in conduct. She felt that if you received an A in conduct, you would be respectful of each other, you would listen, you would turn in your homework on time. She realized that not everybody can get an A plus in calculus or math, but an A in conduct was extremely important to her. One day, three cigarroas, two cousins and myself got a C in conduct. <laughs> we were terrified. A cousin, my entrepreneur cousin, felt that it was easy to convert a C to an A. That's when I learned the lesson of honesty and integrity. <laughs> a day never to be forgotten in the Cigarroa household. Well, secondly, uh, growing up along the Texas-Mexico border region, again, was just a great joy uh, to really learn and live the best of both worlds, the United States and Mexico. Uh, my grandfather was a rancher in Mexico, and that's where I learned the love of the land. Uh, my father, my uncle, my grandfather were physicians in that border town, and I had the opportunity to make house calls with my father, seeing firsthand, you know, really health care disparities uh, because those patients did not have access to health care unless the physician went to their home. As a 15-year-old, I got to see my very first operation. Uh, my uncle Leo, a general surgeon, would have to travel sometimes hundreds of miles because that region of Texas did not have a general surgeon. 
going back to the vision of Mr. Sanchez about the importance of providing health professional educational opportunities because there are still profound health disparities. I saw my very first operation in Roma, Texas with Mario Ramirez. It was a cesarean section. I remember I almost fainted. <laughs> my vision of becoming a surgeon was rapidly evaporating and Mario Ramirez, the person who he is, said, it happens to everybody. But anyhow, uh, my growing up in Laredo gave me a roadmap of what works on the border in terms of education and the delivery of health care. Pediatric surgery, on my hand, was the ideal background for leading an academic health center because it exposed me to one of the most demanding surgical fellowships in the world under the mentorship of outstanding clinician scientists. My surgical training provided strong foundations that I continue to rely on today. I learned that a surgeon needs to lead, needs to be decisive, needs to inspire a team of professionals to do their very best. And furthermore, a leader in surgery must hold himself or herself along with members of the team accountable when the expected patient outcome is not achieved. It's a microcosm of what goes on in larger life in regards to organizations, especially universities. And I may add there were many times that um, you were dealt incredible challenges. I was a two months into my fellowship in transplantation surgery. I was involved with a liver transplant you know, of an adult patient with severe portal hypertension. And I was doing this, I was you know, being guided through this operation by the master surgeon. And I remember as I gently placed the clamp on the inferior vena cava, the vein tore like wet tissue paper and the patient exsanguinated and died on the OR table. There is nothing more unsettling, more defeating for a surgeon. And you can imagine how badly I felt uh, and then having to speak to the patient's family. Well, I thought I'd have a couple of days to recover from that. Four hours later, I was back in the operating room doing another emergency liver transplant with the same master surgeon. I told this master surgeon, please, you proceed and I'll assist. And he goes, no, you must do the operation. You must learn from the past, but now your total attention is on this patient and here's the scalpel. And if that was not, you know, a growing experience, you know, for me, which means you must be able to pick yourself up, remain focused and move ahead. So really in sum, every step of my collective educational life experience has provided me with the attributes necessary to lead a university system with both academic and health institutions and to acquire the trust of faculty, students and staff alike in carrying out the mission of the University of Texas system. And I'm forever grateful to that Board of Regents who realized that despite Francisco Cigarroa not having any administrative background experience, that we felt that he could lead a university. So I remember the board gave that affirmation on a Thursday. I thought I would have November and December maybe to go to Harvard Business School and learn a couple of things. <laughs> this gentleman over here goes, Francisco, I want you to start on Monday. <laughs> There's not a moment to lose. And so I was terrified, but here I was, you know, on Monday, bright and early, starting as president of the Health Science Center, and I went to Barnes & Noble's that weekend to learn Robert Rules of Order. <laughs> I hadn't chaired a meeting ever, but Tony said, you can do it, just go get that book and you'll be fine. <laughs> so anyhow, again, you really have to have individuals, you know, who have confidence in you uh, and people who support you, like Tony supported me and has supported me, you know, just similar to my family. Well, what are we doing at the University of Texas system to really you know, address many of these challenges? First of all, uh, we are very involved with what's going on in K through 12 through our Institute of Public School Initiatives. We are involved in inspiring students who are interested in math and science, not only to cons consider careers in medicine, but also to inspire them to be the future teachers of our young students in K through 12. Because so many of our students aren't being taught by individuals certified in math and science. And it's important that we educate a cohort of teachers
that will inspire our students to pursue those fields, to have a love of lifelong learning, but also to retain those teachers for the long term. Our community colleges, in fact, are so responsible for educating thousands and thousands of Americans. In San Antonio alone, they are responsible for educating over 70,000 students. And so again, it's so important for our four-year universities to be very well aligned with our community colleges to facilitate success. In addition, uh, we are providing an incredible amount of scholarships uh, such that no child who has the focus and the commitment to pursue higher education is ever deprived an opportunity from pursuing a higher education. And we heard about the importance of science and technology and engineering and medicine. And I'm proud to say that the Board of Regents uh, really implemented a competitive initiative that is investing over $2.7 billion for the purposes of enhancing the STEM fields across the University of Texas. And let me emphasize that that money is not just focused on the flagship UT Austin. It is focused throughout the region that we serve, which is all of Texas, with many of our campuses being along the Texas-Mexico border, UT Brownsville, UT Pan Am, UTSA, UTEP. Imagine how transformative this can be. So then without these experiences, I would not have had the choices so beautifully described by Robert Frost as two diverging roads, which for me came as a decision whether to practice medicine exclusively as a pediatric and as a transplant surgeon or to lead an academic health center as its president and then the University of Texas system as chancellor. Tony knows very well, he was one of the very first individuals um, in October of 2008, about, I guess it was maybe the summer of 2008, that I called Tony. Tony has always been a great counselor to me. And I told him, you know, Tony, I met all my objectives as president of the Health Science Center. I've fixed the practice plan, I've enhanced philanthropy, I've really changed the culture of this university. I believe it's time for me to go back to something I love to do every day, which is pediatric and transplant surgery, because I continue to take call every other weekend. Tony said, you know, Francisco, that's a great decision. You, you've accomplished your goals. It's time to set a new horizon. Little did I know, in fact, I announced uh, in public that I was going back to surgery. Again, um, it was completely unexpected that the Board of Regents would ask me to again consider leading the University of Texas system. You know, a very competitive process. I had to interview, I had to compete, but they wanted me not to close that door. So again, another road. Should I do this or should I go back to pediatric surgery? I came, I brought it down to its element. The element was, I came to the conclusion that higher education saves lives. Think about it. Literacy improves public health. It improves the economic vibrancy of this nation. It, it, it improves the national security, not only of this nation, but the world. And if I could do a part of enhancing the University of Texas system's success, then I felt I wasn't far from the Hippocratic Oath you know, of improving the quality of life for others, and thus I made the conclusion to go ahead and interview. Well, as Sandra Day O'Connor, the former U.S. Supreme Court Justice, so beautifully expressed, in order to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry, it is necessary that the path to leadership be visibly open to talented and to qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity all members of our heterogeneous society must have confidence in the openness and in the integrity of our educational institutions that provide this training. So let us ensure that incredible choices and junctures are open for future generations through the choices that we are making in public service. These choices have to do with which students we are reaching out to, which federal and state policies we may choose to become involved with, and ways to buttress our educational system in whatever manner we can in order to achieve a diverse, talented student pool from elementary school all the way to graduate education. I may add that people prosper or fail, careers are developed or lost, depending on what we choose to do, which path we choose to take. So we cannot 
any longer risk complacency as we face a looming storm that is nothing short of a public health crisis if we don't fix it. So we must ensure, in closing, that the student pipeline remains wonderfully competitive, diverse, open, and bountiful, that we ensure that our little children from kindergarten through college pursue knowledge through a deep love of learning, which can cross disciplines in creativity and flashes of brilliance, and that ensure, that we must ensure, that our educational institutions become conduits to serving the greater good. This moment in history demands such a collective effort in the spirit of what is best for our country, for our society, and for this world. So let us choose to seize the moment and follow inspired decisions to their realization. Many of the goals and principles that the Latino Leadership Network embraces. So my belief is that this will make a world of difference for the next generation and generations to come. Mickey, thank you very much for allowing me uh, to express a little bit about my background, my passion for education, and the role that the University of Texas plays in making our nation more vibrant, more prosperous in this world, a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sigaroa. I'd like to invite uh, Tony Sanchez and Congressman Hosa just to come up on the stage for a moment to present our Nambe Eagle Leadership Award. Dr. Sigaroa, the Nambe Award is reserved as a presentation, as a testament, as a marker of outstanding leadership and contribution to our community. So on behalf of the Latino Leaders Network, I'm proud to present the Nambe Eagle Leadership Award. Absolutely. Just uh, a couple of points that I want to close with. Sponsor material and partner publications are available outside the ballroom. Please take what interests you. As Michelle mentioned, we hope to see all of you again at our very next luncheon, which will be September 22nd, where we will welcome CNN anchor Soledad O'Brien. And finally, again, thanks to the Coca-Cola Company, to Verizon, and Anheuser-Busch for making all of this possible today. And most importantly, to Dr. Sigueroa, our honored guest, and all of you, our guests, thank you so much for spending time with us once again. Goodbye. Uh -huh. Okay, um, let's just start with, uh, with, with something extremely broad and extremely big and large, so you can answer uh, quickly and short. And it's, um, about the word uh, reform nowadays is attached to three major issues in this country. One is the education, and you as a professor know about that as an educator. The other one, obviously, is immigration, and I ask you about that as a Hispanic in this country. And the other one is health, and I ask you that as, obviously, as a doctor, as an important doctor in this country, too. So um, what are these three uh, uh, issues with the word reform attached? Um, mean to you? Well, uh, opportunity, um, innovation, and uh, healthy debate, you know, which, you know, is really part of, you know, many of the principles of American life. And uh, as an educator, you know, really universities need to be, you know, at the front and center of, uh, you know, listening to both sides of the arguments on any of those three major issues that you've spoken about. And uh, that's the beauty about being, you know, within the University of Texas system, uh, is that you really have, you know, wonderful exchange of ideas um, coming from various viewpoints, uh, which hopefully will allow, um, you know, policymakers to make the best decisions, um, you know, for the public good. But when we talk about something so controversial in this country like um, uh, 
health reform and um, coverage for, for the data, the raw data is there and it's extremely dramatic in terms of people without coverage, people are struggling for having access to, to healthcare. Um, how do you leave that? Well, again, I, you know, um, it's, it's unacceptable you know, for over 45 million people in the United States uh, to lack you know, basic insurance coverage. And so, uh, you know, the balance is uh, how we can, you know, really confront health care reform. Uh, it's, the current model is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, how can you protect, you know, the important relationship between health care provider and patient and choice, mm -hmm. uh, which has also been a part, you know, of American life. Um, and then, you know, the third aspect is, um, you know, if, if the proposed costs are close to anywhere from one to 1 1.6 trillion, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the best way of approaching that over the next 10 years? And um, that's why we're kind of in the epicenter of this debate right now. But again, um, you know, leading a system with six health institutions, uh, we can certainly play a very important role in hopefully providing better deliveries of health care, uh, which are you know, again, much more cost effective and at the same time, you know, result in better patient outcomes. Um, you know, again, the, the importance of, you know, electronic health records uh, where, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, I've seen as a physician uh, for many of our underinsured or uninsured patients uh, is that they don't have a medical home. Uh, they often visit, you know, emergency room to emergency room um, and at the same time, you know, a medical health record doesn't follow them. Mm -hmm. And so just imagine, you know, trying to, you know, result in an efficient health care plan, you know, for that one patient, you know, to try to individualize health care for that patient. It, it, it becomes close to impossible unless we can solve the problem of, you know, being able to exchange, you know, medical information in a confidential and in an effective way. I think family doctors, uh, which is an old-fashioned thing, is an it's, old... It's not old-fashioned, it still exists. It's a sti it still exists, but it's... My uh, father has been, you know, practicing medicine for over 50 years and uh -huh. is still making house calls. Right. And do you think that um, trying to recover that concept can be one of the keys? I think it's going to be, you know, again, it's pretty hard for anything to, to result in, in an immediate... This will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, probably a provider who's been practicing medicine for 50 years in solo practice uh, may find, you know, find it difficult to suddenly transform, you know, into a you know electronic health record system. Um, but again, you know, the importance of our medical schools uh, in being able to work with communities, uh, with group practices, and eventually individual physicians. In helping implement, you know, part of American healthcare reform, um, but you know, this is going to take some time, in my opinion. Uh, but again, you know, is it important to move forward, you know, with this debate, uh, with substantive reform, uh, and at the same time protecting that fundamental relationship between a physician and a patient? My answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Talk to me as a as a Hispanic in this country. Um, we receive so many uh, uh, great compliments for being the next thing when uh, from a point of view we have always been the thing as part of the American fabric. But um, lately we are being sold as the next thing because the demographics, the numbers are there. Um, how have you lived your life as a Hispanic in, your, in this country? And um, I suppose that that uh, has a lot to do with your life on the border, as a border town uh, native? Well, uh, my heritage has been a part of every attribute that I've brought together in my life. Uh, I grew up in Laredo, uh, right on the border between Texas and Mexico. My uh, uh, paternal grandfather uh, actually fled the Mexican Revolution and ended up in San Antonio. Uh, where he began his medical practice uh, during the depression moved to Laredo you know which is again where I was born and raised um, they taught us three principles um, you know first 
uh, love and respect for each other. Second, you know, the importance of education in one's life and to be a lifelong learner. Third, is a passion to give back to the community. Uh, and also growing up in that environment where, um, you know, we shadowed my father, who's still a physician, uh, seeing how medically underserved uh, that region, you know, of Texas was, uh, to accompany father on house calls. Uh, for those patients who did not have access to clinics or to hospitals because they didn't have any transportation. Uh, to travel with my uncle, who was a general surgeon, to small cities uh, surrounding Laredo that did not have a general surgeon. Uh, again, really open up your eyes about how important education is, how important as a physician one has to be accessible, uh, you know, affordable, and still be excellent in the way you take care of your patients. Uh, and then also, you know, really you know, learning the best of both worlds, which is, you know, the culture that I inherited and the language that I inherited, you know, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, the wonderful culture of, you know, being an American citizen. So, you know, again, you know, being on the border, um, I really got the best of both worlds. I would spend every, every holiday, every summer vacation with my grandfather, who was a rancher in Mexico. And in the summers, I would in, in, in Tamaulipas, and Tamaulipas. The, the ranch was on the border between Tamaulipas and Coahuila. Mm -hmm. But that's where I also learned, you know, the love of the land. In fact, I, I, I thought I was going to be a rancher at some point in, in my life. But my abuelito said, uh, "I think you'll be better off as a physician." Um, but but anyhow, you, you can get the sense of, of, you know, that I really lived both worlds, mm -hmm. and it really has served me well. Um, not only as a student in college, uh, but as a physician, um, and also as a, you know, administrator of both the Health Science Center and now the University of Texas system. Uh, so, in regards to, you know, students being exposed to kind of a global world, I was exposed to that on my first day of life. So, lastly, um, uh, I know you come from a family of eight brothers and sisters. Ten. Ten. Mother was going to have 12, and my grandfather said he would buy her a limousine, and after 10, she said, you can have the limousine. Okay, <laughs> okay let, let, let's talk about how that uh, shaped you also. Uh -huh. uh, we have talked about uh, the, the Hispanic factor, the doctor's factor. Uh, let's talk about the family factor, living in that sten extensive family. And, uh, and I have read, um, under the influence of an extremely disciplinary mother, is that true? Yeah, I still had some bruises. <laughs> no, she was a very, she is a very loving mother. But imagine raising five children and I mean five boys and five girls. Uh, you know, she had to be tough. Um, but really, you know, again, my reflections in my family go back to my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother, Abuelita, uh, her name was Josefina. Uh, every Sunday, the families would get together for a comida, and. Uh, my abuelita would gather all her grandchildren around the table and give us a dollar. And then she'd ask us to return the dollar to her and say that this dollar is going to go, you know, into, you know, a checking account for your college education. And so, you know, we were five or six. And we were hoping to buy bubble gum, but, mm -hmm. you know, we never saw the dollar for that. And actually, she kept her word uh, when we graduated from high school. Uh, she said, here's your savings you know, uh, to pay for college. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, the joy of my family, you know, for their children was, you know, really this installation of a love of learning. Um, all 10 of us uh, graduated from college, uh, you know, uh, and all 10 of us, uh, you know, received a professional education. And many of us are, you know, still in university life giving back to the community through uh, being faculty at universities. Um, and, you know, several brothers went back to Loretta to join my father's practice in medicine. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this, uh, circle. this circle of life is that the, the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, uh, each one of them has also, you know, each one of them graduated from high school or, or going to college and uh, you know, are trying to be the best they can uh, to improve the quality of life in this world.